Walking with Jesus through the Gospels, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 19. Now, we're going to be going through a number of uh, passages, going through all four Gospels. So have your fingers at the ready. But we're going to begin in Luke, chapter 19. And I'm going to get you to uh, go over to John chapter 12 as well, just so you have your a marker there or fingers there. Heads up, we'll be spending some time in Matthew chapter 21 and Mark chapter 11, besides some other passages of Scripture. Of course, uh, we're seeing everything that Jesus is doing is with the backdrop of Exodus. So we'll be spending some time in the Old Testament as well to see what, why Jesus is doing what he's doing. So let's begin by picking it up in verse 28. When he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this. The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So let's stop there and go over to John chapter 12. We'll pick up two verses here, verses 12 and 13. Now you may, may be thinking, uh, we've already dealt with this last time we were together. That's true. We did deal with these, the, um, the entry, the triumphal entry of Jesus and the purpose and so on of it. But we need to be seeing some things that are involved with this. Why the people were coming, responding to Jesus in this way and how that's leading us into what's coming up. So verses 12 and 13 of John chapter 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So, and then he, John continues on speaking about the donkey that uh, they'll go and get and the purpose and the reason for that and quoting Zechariah chapter 9. Now, uh, have a look back in Luke chapter 19 and verse 36. As he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. We see that all of these people became aware that Jesus was in Bethany. And the, the area of Jerusalem has swelled to many times its uh, regular population because the Feast of Passover is at hand. So they are there preparing themselves for the Passover. We know that at this point, it is Lamb Selection Day, the 10th of Nisan. It's the first day of the week. So we're looking at it now being Sunday. People hear about Jesus being there from the night before. Uh, some people had already gone out to Bethany, those that two miles, and they wanted to see Lazarus. They wanted to see Jesus, the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. And now Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem. But there is the route or the route that he is taking now. 
And I want to draw your attention to the screen, and we will have a look at that. Now, if you have motion sickness, you might not want to look at this. We'll be looking at some stills of it afterwards. It's a bit of a uh, short video here to show an overview of present-day Jerusalem, Bethany, Bethphagi, the Mount of Olives now coming into and overlooking the old city of Jerusalem and then turning around looking now eastward back towards the Mount of Olives. So here's what's taking place. We have Jerusalem, Bethany, this is where Jesus has been staying, and Mary, Martha, Lazarus. He's beginning to make his way now to Jerusalem. We've seen that he's going to Bethphagi. Uh, as, as they're approaching Bethphagi, Jesus sends his disciples on ahead. All right, so this is what's taking place. Mount of Olives is just beyond that. Technically, we could say that uh, they are on the slopes of the backside slopes, the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. So let's take it now as though we are journeying from Bethany. So here we are, Bethany, on our way to Bethphagi. The disciples have now gotten uh, a donkey and her colt fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. But before this happens, and the people are making their way out to where Jesus is, so likely meeting him some way, somewhere uh, between Bethany and Bethphagi before he actually mounts this colt. Zechariah 14 would be coming to mind because they heard that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. So I'd like for us to go to Zechariah chapter 14. This will help explain part of the fervor of what's going on with them uh, taking palm branches and then laying down their cloaks for, uh, for the Jesus, whom they are, many, most of them, and many of them, I guess, are looking at him as being the Messiah. So in Zechariah chapter 14, I want to look at verse 4. On that day... His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. This is speaking about the Lord, the, the Messiah. So the Lord, uh, verse 3, we'll go back just to get the context. The Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies between Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half shall move southward. Now, this entire passage, chapter 14 of Zechariah, is bringing into the context of the messianic rule and reign. And then we see down in verse 16, they're expecting a battle. So 14 details this battle that will be going on. Verse 16 Everyone who survives of all the nations that have come up against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And then continues on speaking about uh, some of the things that will be taking place. And then uh, in verse 18, if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. Sh there shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. This shall be the punishment to, the, to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. So the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, is what typifies or, or represents the Messianic era, the Messianic reign. So we would refer to that as the millennial reign or the thousand-year rule and reign of Jesus. So they're anticipating that the Messiah, Jesus, has come. We've been talking about that the last few times we've been together, seeing the, uh, the heightened anticipation. So even though this is six months after the Feast of Booths or uh, Sukkot, 
or the Feast of Tabernacles, the people have this anticipation that even though it's Passover, they're going to celebrate like it's the coming, the arrival of Messiah at the Feast of Booths. And this is, you see that he, it says that he will come the day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Now, for you and me, since the, since the cross, we're expecting that Jesus, when he returns, it'll be from heaven coming down to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. For them, they weren't necessarily looking that he has to come down just as long as he's in their midst and that he will, you can be anywhere in the world and then when you come, whether you walk or drive or fly in order to get to and then finally the destination of the Mount of Olives, get out and walk, uh, you don't have to come from uh, heaven in order for this to be fulfilled in their minds, that the, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. And this is their anticipation that he's going to conquer their enemies. So do you see that coming from the Mount of, uh, from Bethany now to Bethphagi, they're coming out because of this anticipation of Messiah, they know that he has to go over the Mount of Olives in order to get to Jerusalem, thereby fulfilling this passage of Scripture. And then by the time uh, they get to Bethphagi and Jesus mounts the colt, another messianic uh, prophecy, and also from the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 9. So they're looking at this like, uh, all right, we're celebrating Passover, and Passover represents their, their deliverance from Egypt, now Rome. So it's like this fervor is just being filled up, and, and uh, it's overflowing with anticipation that if this is indeed the Messiah, we don't want to miss out on what's about to take place. So that's why they've got all of these palm branches, because that's part of the celebration of the Feast of Booths, Sukkot. And along with that, they're laying down their garments and that rec uh, identifying or, or seeing Jesus as royalty. All right, so he, he leaves, he continues on from Bethphagi, and now on the Mount of Olives. So looking at an aerial view, of course, from the Mount of Olives, looking downwards, westward to the city of Jerusalem. And of course, there is the Temple Mount. But this is obviously present day, not just a depiction. And we don't have the temple there today. Uh, in that their time, the temple would be standing there. Now, uh, here they are crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what is, what is this cry? It's a cry that is saying, please save us. Give us freedom. We're sick of these Romans. So they're crying out, deliver us, deliver us. So 1,500 years ago, the Lord delivered us from Egypt. Now deliver us from Rome and deliver us from the tyranny of all of the nations. Well, when they crest the Mount of Olives, here's what they would have seen. This is what Jesus would have seen. So you'll see these blue markers that are coming up along the Mount of Olives. These are not accurate to the exact placement, but there would have been four locations on the Mount of Olives, and they were referred to as the booths of Annas. Annas was the uh, figurehead high priest. He formerly had been the high priest, but he's not now. Right now, his son-in-law, Caiaphas, is the high priest. So when you see the name Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest, there's only one high priest, but Annas is, is serving, in a sense, and you'll come to appreciate this in a moment, uh, as the godfather, the mafia boss as it were. So he pulls the strings in the background. It's a very political thing, the high priesthood positions during this point in Israel's history. All right, so these four locations, the four booths of Annas, or the sons of Annas, it is 
uh, marketplace that is set up there. So three market locations. Now, I want to read a couple of passages here for you from Josephus, the first century his Jewish historian, and from the book of Antiquities of the Jews, one of his writings, he says this, but as for the high priest Ananias, that he so Annas and Ananias, uh, two names, two, two ways that he's referred to, he was a great hoarder of money. He also had servants who were very wicked, who joined themselves to the boldest sort of people and went to the thrashing or threshing floors and took away the tithes that belonged to the priests by violence. So throughout Israel, the people would be bringing their tithes to the Levites, then the Levites, so the Levitical servants, then they would take a tenth of theirs to the priesthood that would be serving in Jerusalem. So Ananias, or Annas, he would be sending his slaves, his servants, to go and he was, he was extortioning the priests that he's supposed to be serving and supplying for. And they did not refrain from beating such as would not give these tithes to them. So in other words, if you're one of these priests that were serving and this portion was available, was being given to you, and now you're threshing it on the floor. Keep this in mind, the threshing floor, okay? They are threshing the grain. Now, if they uh, find themselves in a place that I'm not going to um, give you what you're asking for, they would beat them. And so the other high priests acted in the same manner as did those his servants without anyone being able to prohibit them. In other words, this, they were the mafia. This was the mob, the, Jew, the Jewish mob, the high priest mob, and Ananias is the godfather. And so they couldn't prohibit them so that some of the priests that of old were want to be supported, in other words, they needed to be supported, they didn't have any other means of support by these tithes, they ended up dying because of a lack of food, because Ananias was extortioning these priests. All right, so this just gives you a snapshot into the, to some of the aspect of Annas or Ananias. From another of jo Josephus' works from the uh, wars, it's, uh, it says, and now the multitude were going to rise against them already for Ananus. So he, he uses a different spelling, different wording for him. The uh, ancientest or the oldest of the high priests persuaded them to it, that being this. These men made the temple of God a stronghold for them and a place where they might resort or find sanctuary um, in order to avoid the troubles that they feared from the people so that the high priesthood there's trouble going on in Jerusalem and the priesthood now uh, the sanctuary has now become a refuge and a shop of tyranny so a place where brutality is going on by the high priest so here is Annas he served as high priest for nine years, from 6 A.D. to 15 A.D. And the, the governor of, of Jerusalem at that time ousted him, in other words, removed him from the, the high priesthood position for imposing and executing capital punishment, which had been forbidden by the Roman government. So here he is, basically a mobster. His son, Eleazar, served in his place from 16 to 17 A.D., so just a, a year and a half or so. And then we see Joseph ben Caiaphas, his son-in-law. He becomes high priest in 18 A.D., and he serves uh, for 18 years. 
they had these booths, and they're called the booths of Annas or the booths of the sons of Annas because he had five sons and one son-in-law. Well, these booths or marketplaces, so as you saw them there, let's bring them back up again here for a moment. So these booths are what Jesus and all of the people gathered would be at least able to see, whether or not they're noticing at this point, they'd be able to see them as they're cresting the Mount of Olives, getting ready their downward slope or westward slope towards the uh, temple. These booths, not only did they have booths here, but they had two booths in the temple in the court of the Gentiles. We'll show you that in just a moment. And what took place in these is that they had a monopoly on the sale of sacrificial animals and exchanging money to the temple currency. And they charged these a high inflated prices. So they were charging interest basically against their, their brothers, which the scriptures forbade them to do, but they did it just the same. It, it just became this picture of the corruptness of the priesthood. So you're getting a picture of what's going on. The anticipation of the people where they are and looking for Messiah, Jesus. He is fulfilling the scriptures, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Coming on the, the uh, colt or the foal of a donkey. And with Zechariah 14, 4, he's coming. His feet are on the Mount of Olives and coming now to Jerusalem. And... As they are cresting the Mount of Olives, looking at the old city, they are, are just filled with praise and adoration and excitement that Jesus, the Messiah, is come. But it's only a certain group of people. It's not the leadership of Israel. And they've already rejected him, and we have dealt with that already in the past, particularly in Matthew chapter 12. Well, I want us to bring our attention back to Luke chapter 19 for a moment. And I want us to look at verse 37. So as he's drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, now the disciples, they just, um, the whole multitude of his disciples, this is when they begin with this shout because... Um, it's shortly after the donkey has been gotten from Bethphage. Numbers have been coming out more and increasing, and they're starting to recognize, put some uh, scriptures together. And the, it's just like all this chain reaction is going on with their anticipation now. So they're coming down the Mount of Olives. Let's, uh, so here's their, his descent down the Mount of Olives, and he'll be coming into Jerusalem from the Golden Gate, or the Eastern Gate. Um, another, just a closer view of the, uh, the Temple Mount. Let's have a look at one more uh, aspect here. I'm sorry for uh, switching back and forth. I just wanted to make, sh make sure I wasn't missing something. So here it is, a depiction now of the Temple and Jesus is coming in this direction towards the eastern gate. And these are the two locations indicated by the blue markers of the other booths of Annas where this monopolizing sale of sacrificial animals and uh, currency exchange for the temple currency is going on. So there's a lot taking place here in this, these few verses. Now, it says the whole multitude of the disciples. And something I want to point out to you, this is not the same crowd that gather on Friday morning that are yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. So we will look at that when we get there, but I wanted to sort of put a flag or a marker here so that you're aware that this is not the same crowd. And when we get to Friday morning's events, I will explain to you how we know that that is the case. Well, the, the uh, religious leaders, the Pharisees, they are not happy 
about this event. They're not happy about the response and especially the declaration, uh, pronouncement of the uh, uh, disciples, all, all these people that are gathered together. And so they begin to rebuke uh, the disciples, they're, they're telling Jesus to rebuke them because they're not listening, of course, to the Pharisees to whatever degree. They're trying to tell them to be quiet. And Jesus makes an interesting response to the Pharisees. And he says to them this in verse 40. I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. What does he mean by that? The very stones would cry out. We looked at this a couple of times in the past, but now that we are here, it's, uh, it would be useful for us to be looking at what it is that Jesus is referring to. The stones, the very stones crying out. Well, in Leviticus chapter 14, we have here details and specifications of what are to take place if a house has leprosy or mildew, mold, uh, a festering disease, as it were, where it defiles the house. And from verses, so this is Leviticus 14, from verses 33 to the end of the chapter, it's dealing with uh, how to deal with leprosy in the house. Particularly, I want us to see what is to take place if this festering mildew or mold that this is specifically referring to, but leprosy is the general term, and leprosy speaks of uh, sinfulness and uh, an unwillingness, first of all, an un inability to deal with it yourself. You can't get rid of it. And secondly, the uh, unresponsiveness to the Lord who will take away our sin when we come to him in faith. If we come to him in faith, he will take it. But we need to come to him. If we don't and just make it look like we're coming to him or whatever the case, that leprosy of sin is still in our hearts. I want you to see in verse uh, 43, if the disease breaks out again, so there's certain time frames that are being spoken about, the stones that had been in the house that they were not getting better, they weren't improving, the, the mildew was still persisting, they're to take those stones out and replace them with new stones. And that part of it is a picture of what Jesus did three and a half years earlier in John chapter 2, the first time he came into the temple to cleanse it. Well, we're getting ready to, for him to come into the temple to cleanse it a second time, but it's three and a half years later, the end of his earthly ministry, or at least in his bodily, earthly ministry as he is bodily. So if the disease breaks out again, after he has taken out the stones and scraped the house and plastered it, then the priest shall go and look. And if the disease is spread in the house, it is a persistent leprous disease in the house. It's unclean. Here's what needs to be done. He shall break down the house, its stones and timber, and all the plaster of the house, and he shall carry them out of, this, out of the city to an unclean place. Moreover, whoever enters the house while it is shut up shall be clean, unclean until the evening. And then continues on with... Uh, various aspects of cleansing and so on once if the house is clean and it hasn't persisted. But do you see what's to, to take place is that the stones are to be uh, broken down. All of the stones, all of the timber, the plaster, everything is to be taken out of the city and left as a ruinous heap, a heap of rubble. Well, I'd like for us to go ahead to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk We're getting there Habakkuk 
almost there. My fingers are so dry today and I can't even hardly turn my pages. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bear with me just a moment. There we go. We have arrived. Okay, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 12. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts, the people's labor merely for fire. And I'm sorry, not 12 and 13, beginning in verse 11. Um, let's, let's start in verse 9. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. So all of this is being done by wickedness, by evil gain. For you have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. Keep that in mind. You've cut off many peoples. You have fortified your life. In other words, you've tried to make things better for yourself at the expense of and, and lack of caring consideration for others. So you have, uh, you have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. This is speaking back to Leviticus chapter 14. Like the stones are crying out, the woodwork's crying out, the beams, um, that this needs to be torn down. And that's what Jesus is dealing with in this respect. When he's coming, he's approaching uh, Jerusalem, and the Pharisees are saying, uh, tell your disciples to stop crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, as they are recognizing him as the Messiah, they, the Pharisees, have no use for Jesus whatsoever. They are planning with the chief priests and so on the, his death. Well, when Jesus says, I tell you that uh, if they, these disciples were quiet, then the very stones are, will cry out. If you don't want to hear them, then I'll leave the stones of the house, the, the leprosy that's in the house, I'll leave that to speak. But Jesus is going to be dealing with the leprosy in the house as well. And he's going, he, in a sense, he's foreshadowing that which he's going to be doing, uh, carrying out against this house tomorrow on Monday. So remember, presently we're Sunday, the first day of the week. Palm Sunday. So it's a very serious thing that they are being confronted with here and, and being indicted with. Jesus is charging them with this guilt. Well, back to Luke chapter 19, verse 41. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had, made, uh, had known on this day the things that make for peace. It's interesting that he states this, even though this, this multitude of people have gathered together and they are calling on him as the Messiah. He's, he's not ignoring these that have gathered around. Luke speaks very clearly that these were his disciples. So, what he's speaking about is the multitude that are still within Jerusalem and throughout Israel, and particularly the Jewish leadership that have completely rejected him and have led so many astray and turned people from following after Jesus. So this is why he's speaking this out. He's speaking it to the multitude at large, not for the majority of the multitude that is surrounded him presently and they're longing for his deliverance. Now they, they can only see so much and so far. They're seeing deliverance right now, anticipating it to be from Rome. But Jesus has come to give an even greater deliverance so that the deliverance uh, of tyranny of governance would have purpose and meaning. Without that, it's just a relief from some oppression and tyranny for a time. But Jesus gives deliverance from sin, and that's what he's come to accomplish. So he says, but now they are hidden from your eyes, verse 43. Uh, keep 42 in mind for a moment. We're going to be checking something out in reference to that. 
For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side, and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Shortly, in another day or two, Jesus is going to be given, giving uh, a teaching to his disciples primarily who speak about the stones of the temple buildings and Jesus is being will be more specific at that time that there won't be one stone upon another of the temple here he's being general just speaking about the uh, catastrophe the destruction that's going to be coming against Jerusalem you didn't know the time of your visitation the people were not responding to or re uh, receiving the Messiah Emmanuel who was with them right there and speaking these very words. So he's foreshadowing that which is about to take place and what he's going to speak to further even tomorrow, so on Monday, Monday's events. What about verse 42? He said, this is how he begins, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. They're hidden from your eyes. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah chapter 59, and I want us to go and have a look at Isaiah 59. He's dealing specifically here with verse 8. The way of peace... I'll wait another moment for you to get there. Isaiah 59 and verse 8. The way of peace they do not know, and there's no justice in their paths. And so he deals with uh, the first aspect of this. Had, would that you had known on this day the things that make for peace. And he's saying in Isaiah 59, 8, you, you didn't know the, the way of peace. So the very same thing and a similar context of what's going on. There's no justice in their paths. They've made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. And of course, Jesus has come as, the, intending at that point, as the Prince of Peace. One of his many titles, of course, of which we had looked at this past Sunday. The context of Isaiah 59, look at the very first verse. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And it goes on to speak about the defilement of the people, um, all their attempts at righteousness, they are futile. Uh, I'll leave them there for you. Uh, I encourage you to read through this. If we took time to read every passage that we're going to be cross-referencing, we would be dealing with a, a huge amount. But here's what we see is that even though they're in this condition, that the Lord, He ends up working with zeal. He puts on zeal like a cloak in order to bring about salvation for the people. And this is with anticipation of the Messiah who would come to accomplish this. Look at verse 20. And a Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turns from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you, Isaiah, and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So we see this anticipation that the Lord is going to bring about goodness and redemption. The Lord is their redeemer. Well, I'd like for us to go to Mark chapter 11. We'll bring in another gospel writer's comment here. Mark chapter 11, in the first 10 verses, he's dealing with 
this triumphal entry of Jesus. Uh, Luke alone deals with the aspect of both uh, if these hold their peace or if they remain quiet that the very stones will cry out and he Luke is the only one that mentions about his lament over the people of Jerusalem and Jerusalem represents all of Israel even as all of Israel has gathered in Jerusalem at this very moment for the Passover. So then we see this uh, brings us to the end of Sunday's events in verse 11. And he entered Jerusalem. So he does enter into Jerusalem, and he comes in through that eastern gate that I had mentioned and indicated for us. And he went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. All right, you see the sequence of events. It's late now. It's come, coming now into the evening. So now, literally, for the Jewish reckoning of time, it is Monday. Um, so sundown begins the next day. So he goes out to Bethany with the twelve because this is where they are staying for through the duration of this Passover week. Well, Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. On the following day, where we have been following Luke's chronology, in other words, the way that he details and tracks the order of events for us, where he doesn't detail specific events or chrono chronological uh, sequences, we then default to Mark when Mark does that. And then we default to the other two, um, Matthew and John, when Luke and Mark don't. If John and Matthew do, then we default to them. But Luke tends to be the greater of the two uh, time sequence or chron chronologists. Mark then follows right on his heels when Luke doesn't do so. Matthew and John tend to be more thematic. And they tend to group things together. So on the following day, when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. So this is now Monday morning. And seeing in the distance a fig tree, let me see if I'm missing something here. All right, there we go. I'm sorry, I, just, I went to bring us to a slide and it wasn't looking like the right one. So we have them on their way back to Jerusalem. You remember the route from Bethany to Bethphage, uh, across the Mount of Olives and then down into Jerusalem. So they came from this direction here. Um, we're gonna depict what's taking place, seen in the distance of fig tree in leaf, so Jesus sees this fig tree, and he went to see if he could find anything on it. Now remember, he's hungry. He sees the fig tree in a distance, and he goes to see if anything is on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Why does Jesus do this? So we see that Jesus curses the fig tree on their way into Jerusalem, on their way, whether this is on the Mount of Olives or just on the approach on the um, eastern side between Bethphage and, and Mount of Olives. We d don't have that detail. But he sees it in the distance. It's like he runs over to it uh, a short distance from it, and he sees that there, it's in leaf, but there's no fruit, and so he curses it. And notice what it says in verse 14 when he says, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. His disciples heard it. I keep that in mind because it's not going to be until tomorrow that we actually see the events take place, the unfolding of all of this. And 
Why did Jesus say this? Obviously, if there's no fruit, there's no fruit. If it's not the season for fruit, then why expect there to be fruit on it? Why did he go to see if there was fruit? And why would you curse it for having no fruit if it's not the season for figs? Well, the reason for it is this. This is a fig tree listed for, imaged for you here. And these little knobs that are here, they appear about six weeks uh, after or, or before the, the main figs come on to the tree. And these are called taksh. It's spelled T-A-Q-S-H, taksh. It's like the pre-fruit. What this is, is it's nubs of fruit that grow on last year's branches. And the actual figs that will grow full and plump and lush will grow on this year's branch growth. So what happens is that these talks, they appear at the same time as the leaves appear. So the, when it comes into the, the early part of the year, the spring, the leaves start to appear un, unfurling on the fig trees. And at the same time as the leaves come in full, you've got these buds, um, almost like an immature uh, fig. And they, they won't be as, most of the time, they won't be as... Uh, moist or what's what's the word I'm looking for they won't be as as plump and lush and they'll be a little more tough than the regular figs that come but if there's leaves on a fig tree it's advertising that there are these talks there is fruit and this is why Jesus speaks this to this fig tree now what is the purpose of it what purpose does it serve well, we don't see that until what happens next and then what happens tomorrow on Tuesday. Remember, today is Monday. What's going on in this, this sequence of events is Monday morning. So this is what Jesus speaks to it, what he does. It's like the tree is advertising, I've got fruit, but when you come to inspect it, there's no fruit there. So his disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem. They keep on coming. It's like Jesus rejoins the group now, and they continue on their way to Jerusalem. He entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. We'll, leave, we'll stop there so that we uh, don't get ahead of ourselves. Matthew parallels this account in Matthew chapter 21. He deals with it in verses 12 and 13 and then Luke deals with it back in Luke chapter 19 and he does so in verses 45 and 46 so it's not a massive amount of space that's being used here but it is a very important portion for us to uh, dig in and investigate it says that uh, Mark tells us and he was teaching them, saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? Well, why am I dealing with that before we see about this cleansing of the temple and the, the overturning of the tables and uh, for the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons? Why did Jesus do that? Well, uh, he's not upset with the people sitting at the tables, per se. What is he upset at? He's upset at those who are behind the reason that the tables or the marketplace is there. 
This has nothing to do with uh, merchandise being sold by ministries, preachers, evangelists, singing groups that may come to your church or may come to our church. This has nothing to do with them having books or CDs or other products that they would be selling in the foyer or anything like that. Nothing to do with that at all. It is, Jesus is dealing with a heart matter and the heart is being evidenced by what is now in the court of the Gentiles. It's, it's like the, um, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes, they're all about an appearance of righteousness, but they don't have any fruit of repentance. Do you remember John the Baptist? In Mark, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, he told them to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, if you say that you are followers of God, then there ought to be fruit that would be evidence of that. And for the religious leaders, uh, for the most part, they're like the fig tree that Jesus had just passed a short time ago that are advertising big leaves, advertising that I have fruit, but on closer inspection, discovering that there's nothing there of substance whatsoever. Uh, and it's like Jesus knows that. He goes to the fig tree to inspect it. The disciples didn't. It was Jesus who does this. And when he sees there's no fruit, he curses it. Jesus, he is, uh, he's longing for this fruit to be produced. He's longing for this fruit to be present. But he's been ministering to these religious leaders and to the, to the multitudes now for a long time. And they are simply not having anything of it. They're not responding to him. So the reason that he is overthrowing these tables, it's because of the heart of those who control the tables is wicked. And these are the ones who are leading the people of Israel, the ones that are the shepherds and supposed to have care and concern for the people. Remember the booths of Annas that we had seen indicated by those blue markers? I want us, I want us to go to 2 Samuel. Um, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 24. I'm trying to determine how much we are going to deal with because of our time. But uh, we'll be able to get a good ways into this before we have to delay our journey continuing until next week. So 2 Samuel chapter 24, and I want us to look, look at verse 15. Now David, he had sinned against the Lord and he had uh, gone ahead and conducted a census for the purpose so that he would see how strong he is. So censuses uh, in and of themselves were not a bad thing. The Lord had instructed the people of Israel to conduct censuses uh, on a number of occasions. But in this instance, it was David's own idea, and he was doing it for the purpose of seeing where his strength lay. He had taken his eyes off of the Lord for a time, failing to recognize that his strength comes from the Lord. Well, in verse 15, after uh, destroying angel was bringing uh, destruction up upon Jerusalem, here's what we see in verse 15. The Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. There died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. Now notice David's heart. He has changed. He has repented of his sin. So I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. 
Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. Notice a couple of things. That it's a threshing floor that he's to um, set up this altar. I, not a couple of things, it's just that one thing. And David, he went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Arana looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. Now, Arana is, one, is the last Jebusite that is spoken about in the scriptures. So the Jebusites were the ones that occupied the city of Jerusalem until David was successful in conquering the city and made it the capital. So he went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground, and Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. So Arana said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. So Arana is saying, These things... Basically, his tractor at his plow, his threshing sledge that was taking care of the grain to thresh it, to separate the grain from the, uh, the chaff from the, uh, the kernel of wheat. Here, take it. So the oxen and the, the wood, take it and offer it as a sacrifice. But the king said to Arana, no, but I will buy it from you for a price, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. Do you, I want you to see the contrast between David's attitude here. Initially, his attitude was similar to the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees where he was about himself. He's pointing his focus at himself What's my strength like? And so on. And he jeopardized the people as a result of it. But he was quick to repent when he recognized his sin and his foolishness. And he says, I'm not going to offer to the Lord something that costs me nothing. He's, he's, not, uh, he's not flogging himself as though I've beaten himself down. You know, I need to pay for this. What he's saying is that... If you're offering it, then how can I be the one to offer it? If it doesn't cost me anything, it's not mine to give. So if, a, if you're giving it at no cost, then you are the one that is giving it to the Lord. He says, no, I will buy it so that it is mine to give to the Lord. In other words, I want to give this to the Lord, and I can't do it just as you handing it to me. It's got to become mine, and it's got to be by a price. He's not trying to buy salvation or forgiveness. It's that he's it's like Mary who was offering the ointment uh, and pouring it on Jesus. In a similar way, he's saying, I'm taking that which is going to be costly and giving it to the Lord. But the chief priests, they didn't care about that sort of thing. They were getting themselves rich by selling the sacrificial animals at a jacked up price at on the backs of the common Jew and they didn't care they were stealing the the threshed wheat even as it's on the threshing floor from the priests they didn't care even to the point that some of them were dying because they didn't have enough food David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver silver represents redemption. So he's taking this here and as a symbol of the redemption that comes from God and God alone. And he builds an altar to the Lord. He offers burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. So this place, Arana's threshing floor, it became a picture of a deliverance from death. He, what David does here is this anticipation of putting an end to the, the place of, of destruction, the destroying angel. Death is a result of sin. So we see this picture together, and now it's being turned around to be a place of life. In 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, 
we see that it is on this very spot that Solomon builds the temple. And it's that same location, the same foundation area that the temple now stands and where Jesus is confronting these, these sellers of the merchandise, but not necessarily the sellers. They're just hired men who are looking to earn a living, but it's those that are in charge of them. And it's Annas and his sons. And the sons refer to the chief priest at that time, Caiaphas, the former chief priest, Eleazar, and the other sons who will end up, every one of them, serving as a priest until A.D. 63. So Jonathan will be a priest, Theophilus, uh, Matthias, and Ananus, four more of his sons will serve after Caiaphas. So it's these ones, the corrupt priesthood, and we had seen them pictured in Jesus' uh, parable in Luke chapter 16, dealing with the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man clothed in purple and fine linen and so on, a picture of the priesthood. He had five brothers, speaking about the actual sons of Annas, the former high priest. So this is, uh, this is where we see the judgment being brought upon them. The threshing floor is right there. This is where Jesus is standing, the former threshing floor. And what is Jesus do, doing with this threshing? We'll look at this and then we will resume next week. So I want us to look at Matthew chapter 3. Something that John the baptizer brings at the beginning of his ministry. Matthew chapter 3, and I want to look at verse uh, 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now pay attention to this. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, this is speaking specifically and most directly regarding the end of the age, the time of judgment. So after people die and, or at, after the return of Jesus Christ as Messiah to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords, this is what that time frame is specifically referring to. But in an immediate sense, it is referring to the very place where Jesus is standing in Matthew chapter 21. He's at the threshing floor, the former threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. And now he's beginning to thresh the wheat. His winnowing fork is in his hand. The threshing has just taken place, and he's separating the wheat from the chaff. Remember, the judgment is being brought upon the house as the house has been defiled. So the house of God has been defiled by those in leadership, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, and the Pharisees and the scribes, and so on. So this is where we see it. One last thing in the book of Psalms, chapter 1. Psalm 1. Look at the contrast. The first three verses uh, speak about the righteous. And then we're going to look at the wicked in the last three verses. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So this is the one who fears the Lord, who delights in the Lord and his word, not just by tradition, or this is what he does, and, or he reads it louder or more often than anyone else. This is something that is truly the heart of this individual, the one who is righteous. He is blessed. The one who follows the Lord and his word, he is blessed. So he's like a tree, full of life, 
producing fruit. Notice that. He's producing fruit. What was the problem with the fig tree? It had no fruit. It looked good, but it had no fruit. In this instance, he's full of life because the fruit is being produced, and the fruit's only produced when the Spirit of God is at work in a person's life. Can't be done just by being more diligent or determined or working harder or longer. Then look at verse 4. Here's the contrast, the flip side. This is de describing now the priesthood. The wicked are not so, but they are like, what are they like? Chaff, threshing floor. This is what it's speaking of. This is the picture that's given to us, that the wind drives away. There's no value to it. There's no weight. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. In judgment, meaning judging that, having a, a right judgment so that they would judge rightly or righteously. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And that's what we see. The very picture is it's unfolding. The scripture is coming to pass and unfolding before our very eyes as we are with Jesus now on this former threshing floor, the location of the temple, the house of God, as he is driving out. He's threshing the wheat and he's blowing away the chaff. He's bringing judgment upon the house of God. We need to leave it there and we will pick it up next week as we resume what it is that Jesus says about his house. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So we'll pick it up there when we come together next week. And I encourage you, read on ahead as uh, we look to this passage of scripture one more time and uh, be blessed by the word of God.